Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Atlantic Council and today's Commander Series event. Uh, we're very pleased and honored to have uh, Admiral Richardson with us today. Thanks for being here. And to guide us through a discussion on maritime uh, superiority and how to maintain that. Very interesting. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Anderson. I'm representing Saab in North America. And uh, we are presenting this series in partnership with the Skullcroft Center here at the Council. Uh, this year we celebrate our 10th consecutive year of the series uh, and we're very proud of, of this accomplishment. The past 10 years has been a period of substantial change and growth both for Saab and the Atlantic Council. Uh, at Saab we've taken significant steps forward to solidify and grow our presence and business in the U.S. and we now have a well-established footprint and impressive portfolio uh, of products and solutions under contract and in service with all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces, as well as several other government agencies uh, such as DHS and the FAA. The Atlantic Council has also continued to grow significantly during the last 10 years, further cementing its position as one of the most influential, if not the most important and influential uh, um, resource and network for international discourse and policy discussion, now covering the entire global arena. As a global defense and security company, responsibility and commitment towards people and society is fundamental to us. And we strongly believe that continuing to build upon the already strong established transatlantic relationships is essential in order to ensure our ability to promote peace and security for all in the future. These are only a few reasons why our support of the Atlantic Council and our sponsorship of the Commander Series are so valuable and important to us, and we look forward to many more years of cooperation. Before I get off the stage, uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Barry Pavel, Director of the Skullcroft Center for a great partnership, and I would like to congratulate Fred Kemp and Damon Wilson for the amazing growth and development we've seen at the Council over the last 10 years and under your leadership. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Fred Kemp, the uh, distinguished president of the Atlantic Council who would introduce our speaker today. Uh, well, welcome to you all. And Mike, thank you very much for that. Um, so we've got, uh, uh, de facto four stars at the Atlantic Council. They don't wear them and anything, but Michael is one of those. And he, on the executive committee of the board uh, in our strategy consortium, uh, the, this lecture series, Pander series, is 10 years old this year. Um, but beyond that, we have an office in, in, in Stockholm, very much uh, in collaboration with Saab, where we look at the Nordics and we look at the Baltics and have really deepened our relations. So thank you very much for all that. Um, I've also worked on cyber issues and, uh, and, and various other things as well. Um, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, to the Atlantic Council 31st uh, Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson. Admiral Richardson, we're grateful uh, that you've given us uh, some of your very valuable time. Um, there are a lot of board members here in the audience, and that's always a good sign. One of them, I think, is an advisor to you, Bob Stevens. Uh, we've got Courtney Godoldi, Stuart, Stuart, Stuart Eisenstadt, Dove Stockheim, who's going to be moderating you. I saw um, uh, Wendy Makins um, and Frank Kramer, and, uh, and it's a really good group of people here, and I probably haven't spotted a couple of them. Tom Pickering, of course, one of our longest-serving board members and great friend of the Atlantic Council. So, and thanks for all those also joining us by live stream uh, and active on social media. We're live tweeting this morning's events. Uh, join the discussion uh, with hashtag AC Defense. Uh, since the Commander Series began in 2009, it actually started in 2007, but with Saab it started in 2009. Top military and defense leaders have come to the Council to help shape the security debate on America's role in the world. Um, these dialogues remain hugely important, uh, even more so as the world we live in changes. Uh, I don't want to go on too long, but I'll tell you, Admiral, there were five issues. Uh, we had strategic repeat retreats being led by um, Steve Hadley on the board and then led by Barry and 
Damon in terms of our staff. And we decided, and I'm going to do this in real shorthand, that there were five issues we had to fundamentally own, and I think they're all taking place in your domain. Um, one of them is a new era of great power competition. The other is uh, questions uh, swirling around the future of democracy and the future of autocracy. Third, future of the U.S. role in the world. Fourth, future of the global system that the founders of the Atlantic Council created. They were there at the creation, Dean Acheson, Henry Cabot Lodge, Lucius Clay, Mary Pillsbury Lord. And then finally, the impact of technology on all of that. And so that's all, it seems to all come together in, in what you're looking at as well. In particular, our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security focuses on developing sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address this challenge. Uh, and led by Barry, it seeks to honor General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embody his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security and support of U.S. leadership and cooperation with allies. So with that, I'd like to introduce Admiral John Richardson, who has served as the uniformed leader of the U.S. Navy and member of the Joint Chiefs Staff since September 2015. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1982 and holds degrees in physics, electrical engineering, and national security strategy. Among his, many naval, among his many assignments, some of the most notable include Commander, Naval Submarine Forces, Naval Aid to the President, and Director of Strategy and Policy at U.S. Joint Forces Command. Admiral Richardson, we look forward to your uh, remarks and the moderated discussion afterwards with one of our board directors, Dov Zuckheim. Uh, I've told him not to hold any punches, so I, I, uh, and I understand he's been working with you closely uh, on many of these important issues in any case, so it should be a really engaging uh, conversation. And once again, in the spirit of our age, Twitter, hashtag AC Defense. Admiral Richardson, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mike, uh, for that introduction, and uh, thanks also to Saab North America for sponsoring this uh, event. Fred, uh, appreciate the introduction, and congratulations on everything that the Atlantic Council has done and has continues to do. I intend to uh, talk and cover each of those five major issues here in my 10 minutes of remarks here. So <laughs> and uh, with respect to working amongst four stars, very comfortable with that. In fact, uh, uh, my wife has made it very clear that no matter how many stars I get, she's that plus one. And so uh, I've got uh, very, you know, comfortable with working amongst five stars. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, uh, you touched on it, this idea of great power competition. And I'll just uh, get through some remarks very quickly because I have always found that the richest part of these uh, events is really getting into the discussion and uh, particularly the audience uh, discussion. Uh, but I'll tell you... Um, we, uh, to address this, uh, this kind of first uh, was mentioned in the Design for Maintaining Maritime Superiority version one, where we identified that we were indeed entering a great power competition. And then uh, the National Defense Strategy, of course, in the early part of 18, uh, made that our defense strategy in response to the security strategy. And we then got to work and made sure that our uh, Navy, Navy strategic thinking, our naval strategic thinking was fully aligned. And that resulted in a couple of uh, documents, guidance, if you will, uh, coming out at the end of uh, 2018, one of which was sort of version two of the design for maintaining maritime superiority, uh, which, which you know, it, was design, it was named version one on purpose because we knew that in this dynamic environment we were going to have to refresh this, come back and check our assumptions, make sure that we were keeping up with uh, the pace of change. And uh, when we think about great power competition, you know, we, we are tempted to hearken back to the last time that uh, we were in such a competition, and you, you alluded to it, uh, you know, kind of the founding of the world order that we uh, participate in today. Uh, and uh, so while certainly the players, some are the same and some are different, much is different, but certainly the rules of this competition and the way that it's conducted have changed a great deal. And so uh, this is where we've tried to uh, focus our attention, not only on the participants in this competition, uh, but also how this competition is unfolding. 
And if you want to just consider some of the changes, uh, even in as I would call traditional an environment as the maritime, if you want to talk about a traditional uh, dimension of maritime activity, you know, the amount of just maritime traffic, shipping traffic on the ocean has quadrupled in the last 25 years since the end of the Cold War. And it's fueled the growth in the global economy, uh, global GDP, you know, roughly doubling in that same period of time. Uh, that's a remarkable fact if you think about it. You know, we've been going to sea, people have been going to sea for 10,000 years easily, and to see a four times increase in the last quarter century is really uh, almost disruptive. And so you see this, you know, contesting pressure uh, on the sea as the traffic increases. But there's so much more, right? There's, uh, you know, the, uh, the information uh, uh, age is on us. And 99% uh, of that information travels on undersea cables, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this maritime infrastructure that is a big part of our dynamic change. And then uh, you mentioned the, the role of technology in general, uh, coming into the environment so much faster and also being adopted, you know, much faster than it has ever been uh, before. So, you know, if you think about the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, launched his telephone, it took about 35 years, you know, for a significant part of the U.S. population to get a phone. Uh, Apple launches his iPhone, and the same population gets it in about three years, three to four years. And, and that phone, of course, brought a lot more uh, to, the, to the table than the uh, phone. And so this, uh, you know, this dynamic uh, way that the competition is being conducted, I think, re requires a sense of agility that uh, we just didn't have before. We could, you know, person by, we'll use a football analogy since we're in the, we're still basking in the victory of uh, the Patriots in the Super Bowl. And um, the uh, idea that, you know, we could have per position by position, the most dominant uh, defense in the, in the league, but if we don't keep pace with the no huddle offense, we're just gonna be falling further and further behind with each play, right? We'll be dominant and irrelevant, and that's not what we need to be doing. And so uh, as we think about where we've been the last uh, 15 uh, years or so, we got very good at uh, sending uh, naval force elements to the Gulf, uh, fighting uh, in CVOA4 up in the Northern Gulf against uh, in the war on terror, and then coming back. And we optimize that system to get the most presence there for the least cost. And uh, that leaned out an awful lot of uh, your Navy and optimized it uh, for that mission. And you know, you've got to always watch that optimize word, right? Because you're optimizing against a set of criteria, and you've got to watch with those criteria. Our criteria have changed now. And so we need to be optimizing towards uh, flexible options. We need to be optimizing towards restoring global maneuver in ways that are much less predictable against these uh, strategic competitors. Um, the response to that of the U.S. Navy in terms of the, the big muscle movements of, the, uh, of our operational goals, one is that we do have to restore a sense of agility. Uh, I would say that we have to restore a sense of conceptual agility in terms of how we think about operating the force. This isn't so much a material uh, challenge as it is just a challenge of the imagination. And so we have to think a little bit more creatively in terms of uh, how we get after this competition, particularly kind of in the lower ends of the spectrum of competition, if you will. Uh, gray war, uh, gray zone conflict, uh, competition below the level of conflict, however you want to describe it. We need to be more imaginative in terms of how we do that. And so we're maturing new operating concepts like distributed maritime operations. We stood up, uh, uh, co coincident with the uh, standing up of Second Fleet and the uh, Joint Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we stood up a development group on the East Coast to try and think, uh, help us, you know, get to these uh, more creative concepts. So that's kind of conceptual agility. Uh, we also need to restore geographic stability. And so, uh, you know, if we could, if it wasn't water and it was uh, land, you could just see these ruts in the, war, in the oceans that uh, we plowed through going over and over 
back and forth to the Gulf, both from San Diego and Norfolk to the Gulf and back. And we need to be moving force elements uh, around the world more dynamically, as I said. And so as I mentioned, we stood up Second Fleet to make sure that we could do that uh, more creatively and effectively in the Atlantic. And um, we're uh, embracing this idea of dyma dynamic force employment. I'm happy to talk about that more in the uh, Q&A, uh, Dove. Uh, but it's kind of a, a naval concept, right? Naval forces are by their design maneuver forces, and we do best when we move around the world. The final dimension of agility we have to uh, recapture is, I would say, technological agility. We simply have to be able to field uh, technology uh, faster than we are doing it right now. I think this is a strategic undertaking that we have. We have a number of great ideas that are on the cusp. Some of these technologies are going to be absolutely decisive in terms of uh, defining who wins and who does not in these conflicts and in these in this new era, this digital era, this information era, uh, you know, first to the market is decisive. And it doesn't have to be first by much, uh, but even a month or two can mean the difference between uh, winning and losing. We simply have to get better at that. And this is something that we, this is just us, right? This is, does nothing much to do with the adversary except that they're moving faster than we're moving right now. Our second response, so in addition to agility, with those three dimensions, second response is that we have to be thinking long term. This is going to be a long term competition, and so we have to be thinking in terms of sustainable types of solutions. We can't be running at the red line uh, all the time, or we're simply going to become uh, too fragile. And then finally, with respect to capability and that spectrum of competition, we really have to make sure that we own the high end of that spectrum. Right, we've got to be decisive on that end of the spectrum so that as crises emerge, we will have the ability to de-escalate those crises uh, and return to a lower energy competition. And we have to do that on our terms, uh, the terms of us and our allies. And so we have to be thinking more uh, sustainably. And so uh, in many uh, ways, as I think of, I look here at the distinguished uh, board members and the panel members of the Atlantic Council, you've got to be thinking that this is a lot of back to the future. And when I talk to the retired four stars, they say, what are you talking about? I thought we were doing this all along. And, uh, and you know, the truth is that uh, it is a bit uh, back to the future, but under a new rule set. And uh, so we're, we're uh, this is the way we're moving out. I think I'll leave it at that and we can explore the details of each of those dimensions uh, through the Q&A, uh, rather than me try and guess what's on your mind. Uh, you can just ask me the question that's on your mind directly. Thank you all very much. Well, thanks, you know. Um, you certainly gave us a lot to think about. And uh, what I want to do, actually, is uh, cut a little bit back on my time so the folks in the audience can throw you the really nasty questions. Um, by the way, you said something very controversial. You, you sort of implied that it was a wonderful thing that the Patriots won. And, uh, and I wasn't implying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll leave it at that. You know, <laughs> It might cost you some budget money. Um, <laughs> Let me I have deep Atlantic roots in, North, in uh, New England. So, so okay. do I. <laughs> uh, let me ask you something that, you know, you talked about back to the future. And one of the things that when I came into this business more than 40 years ago, everybody talked about carrier vulnerability. And here we are back again. A lot of people are talking about carrier vulnerability. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how you address that? What do that? I think about carrier vulnerability? Well, uh, it's a question that is... Uh, for very, very good reasons on our minds. And uh, just as you said, it's, uh, it should be something that is always on our minds because it's such a, uh, uh, well, it's a, it's a tremendous force element for the Navy, for the nation. And uh, it, in many ways, you know, it, it, all of our warships are sovereign U.S. territory, but when you put a, you know, a carrier and a strike group out there, that's a, that's a tremendous expression of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, national power. Um, and as you know, technology continues to advance, there is this kind of back and forth. Um, I would say that uh, you know, the big thing that is 
occupying our minds right now is the advent of sort of long-range precision weapons, okay? Uh, whether those are uh, land-based uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles, coastal defense cruise missiles, uh, you name it. And, um, you know, those weapons connected with the, it's kind of a reconnaissance strike network that's uh, becoming more and more capable. Uh, but the other thing is to, well, you've got to first, you know, this has been the dynamic since, you know, kind of at least Agincourt, right? Uh, the kind of reach and precision uh, dynamic. And it's, a, it's, 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 there's two sides to it, right? There's an offensive part and there's a defensive part. And so the advent of uh, some of these technologies, particularly directed energy types of technologies, uh, coupled with the uh, emerging uh, power generation systems on carriers, is going to make them you know, a much, much uh, more difficult target to hit. So uh, I would say that uh, rather than uh, expressing uh, the carrier as uniquely vulnerable, I would say that uh, another way to express this would be that it is the most survivable airfield within the field of fire, okay? This is an airfield that can move 720 miles a day uh, that has uh, tremendous self-defense capabilities. And if you think about the sequence of events that has to emerge to be able to target and hit uh, of that something that can move that much, and uh, each step of that chain of events can be uh, disrupted uh, from the sensing part all the way back to the homing part. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the most survivable airfield uh, in, in the area. The second is, to your point, uh, I would say that our, uh, in, in many ways, uh, the carrier is less vulnerable now than it has been any time since before World War II. World War II, we were putting aircraft carriers in action, and we saw, you know, that they were in combat, taking hits. Uh, so there was all of the vulnerability that came with that. Uh, I will tell you, during the Cold War, the, the Soviet Union had you know, a tremendous amount of uh, Navy at sea, uh, especially undersea Navy, and there was a vulnerability associated with that. And so uh, you, you lay all of these trends together, and I think, uh, and, and then you know, the capability of the ship, the emerging capability of the air wing, the carrier is going to be a, a viable force element for the foreseeable future. Well, talking about carriers, <laughs> I remember we whole bunch of us, at least those of us who have gray hair or no hair, remember. Um, President Reagan basically got the Navy going to 15 carriers and 600 ships. You're nowhere near that. So your answer to that, I think, is dynamic force employment. And you kind of set me up with your remarks to ask you this question. Right. Maybe you want to expand on that. Sure. Uh, we're at about 287 ships and climbing. Our analysis uh, for now, the number is uh, 355. We're in the middle of uh, reassessing that uh, force structure, and uh, you know we'll see where that takes us. That that uh, study's due to complete later on this year. The 355 includes uh, a demand for 12 carriers, and so that's where we're uh, that that's where we're marching to right now. Uh, then it's the matter of sort of how we employ that force. And uh, this is an area where we're a bit in terms of uh, back to the future in many ways. So instead of just you know, going to the uh, Middle East and back, uh, for instance, we took the uh, Harry S. Juma Strike Group and moved it up into the North Atlantic and north of the Arctic Circle for the first time in, since 1991. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, uh, we were knocking off a lot of rust in terms of how to operate uh, at high-end uh, carrier operations up, up that far north. I'll tell you one thing, it's not changed. You know this, it's still pretty dang cold up there. <laughs> and so uh, so it's, uh, you know, we had to break out a lot of books in terms of how to operate that, uh, old books. And so we were bringing things like baseball bats and everything else to uh, knock off the ice. And, uh, but you know, we, we did it. Uh, communications is uh, not as robust up there as it is in kind of the middle uh, latitudes. And, and uh, those sorts of things. So, but you got to go up there, you got to practice it. Uh, the logistics support to be able to uh, support a uh, strike group in these new areas of the world that we're operating, you know, all, all of that has to be laid in as we optimize towards a, a new dynamic, if you will, a new set of criteria. So talking about up north, can you tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about the Arctic these days? Well, the Arctic is uh, another dynamic in the maritime domain. And so the uh, 
Arctic ice cap in the north is as small as it's ever been in our lifetimes. Smaller than it's, you know, it's the smallest since we started to measure it with satellites. And uh, so what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, there are continental shelves that are now exposed that were not before with their attendant resources. Uh, there are sea lanes that are open for much more of the year than they were, and that has a strategic significance for trade and uh, defense as well. And so uh, we want to make sure, we, you know, the United States is an Arctic nation, uh, we want to make sure that as this dynamic changes that we continue to manage uh, that emerging domain with other Arctic nations in a way that's reciprocal, fair, peaceful, uh, conflict-free, and, uh, and so we're watching that very closely. We, we're partnering closely with the Coast Guard in this, supporting them as they uh, reconstitute their, uh, their fleet of uh, icebreakers. And uh, right now we see that in the sort of the near mid-future, we're on a good trajectory. We're keeping very close eye on it for the long-term trends. Well, China has tried to become, or maybe is becoming, an Arctic nation. I know you were just in China. Could you tell us a little bit about your impressions? What did, what did you take back from this latest trip? You've been there before, of course. Yeah. Well, the aims of our visit uh, to China were, one, uh, we've, we've got to make sure that we continue to have a conversation with China. Right? We've got to be talking, continue to seek deeper understanding of each other's thinking. Okay. And uh, our thinking is, is, is different. Uh, we have common interests in many areas. Uh, I would say a denuclearized uh, Korean Peninsula is an area where we share common interests. Uh, we have differences, uh, you know, some big differences, in terms of our, how we consider the South China Sea. Uh, certainly, we want to converge on those areas where we have common interests and do some good together. Uh, we've got to make sure that in those areas where we have differences, our, you know, the, the, the nature of the dialogue has got to be to minimize risk as we work that out uh, diplomatically, conflict-free, and uh, to, to, to dial down the risk. And then these conversations uh, with our counterparts also very useful that if something should happen, unforeseen, a miscalculation or something, we can ring each other up and de-escalate before it just you know, kind of escalates out of control. So for all those reasons, we went and uh, and wanted to just continue this dialogue. And the theme of uh, our visit was, I, I would say in a word, consistency, and consistency in a number of areas. One, you know, our actions have to be consistent with our words, right? And so with respect to the South China Sea, you know, President Xi made a statement that he would not militarize those uh, features in the South China Sea, and yet we see military systems uh, emerging on the, you know, very sophisticated military systems. So, you know, we made it clear that this inconsistency and the militarization of those islands is a destabilizing factor for the world, really, not just the region, but for the world. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, you know, the United States has consistently been present in the South China Sea, and this goes to our economic prosperity, right, and the role of the Navy in terms of uh, protecting and en enhancing our economic uh, dimension of military power. And so we're not gonna we're not gonna leave, right? We have just too many natural national interests in that body of water. About a third of the world's trade goes through that. And so uh, so this idea of consistency was uh, was a theme uh, with respect to Taiwan, right? Uh, hey, uh, our approach to uh, Taiwan has not changed. We're going to remain consistently uh, uh, focused on that, and uh, would. Uh, you know, not look favorably on any kind of unilateral action on either side of the strait to disrupt that status quo. And so we kept on hammering those uh, themes while we were there. Well, we've got a bunch of very senior diplomats in the room, Tom Pickering, for example. And one of the things you write about in Design 2.0 is a thing called naval diplomacy. Um, in a way, you've been doing that for an awful long time, sometimes firing on people like the Barbary Pirates, right. sometimes doing other things. How do you see naval diplomacy evolving? Because clearly, there was something behind your highlighting that in this right. particular document. But this, uh, uh, the, the aim of including that in the document was to highlight that, uh, well, it's really to just sort of celebrate how lucky uh, one is to be a sailor, right? 
And so when we think about the elements of national power, certainly uh, we want the naval force to be uh, the dominant <coughs> naval power, or the dominant military power in the maritime domain. And so you, know, you talked about all of those five issues, and they all kind of come you know, front and center in the maritime domain, and I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that in general, we're looking at you know, 25 to 50 years easy of a, of a maritime-centric uh, world, right? It's going to be very, lots of responsibilities for maritime forces coming in, in the next uh, 50 years. Uh, and those responsibilities, as I said, not only the military dimension of national power, but the Navy has a tremendous history of, of uh, enhancing the diplomatic element of naval power. And so you mentioned uh, Barbary pirates. I'll get back to that in a second. But you know there have been major treaties and major summits conducted on on U.S. Uh, warships. Uh, you know, gunboat diplomacy is you know there's there's something to that still. Um, uh, when we visit foreign ports, it is almost uh, a given that the, ambas or the U.S. ambassador to that country will host a reception on the ship because it's sovereign U.S. territory. And so there's this uh, rich diplomatic history, and I think that there's a role for that going forward for, the, for Navy. And then I mentioned uh, the economic uh, element of national power and the Navy's uh, almost unique role in uh, preserving sea lines of communication. Ninety percent of the world's trade flows over the seas, and we need to make sure that uh, those sea lines, access to those markets are uh, protected for our prosperity, and uh, then uh, advocate for that rule set that was put in place by some of the founders of the Atlantic Council that uh, provided that level playing field. Uh, with, particularly in the last 70 years, everybody's benefited from that rule set, uh, perhaps most especially China which has uh, grown tremendously uh, uh, with that international order. So we need to advocate uh, for preserving that. Well, I'm going to ask you one last question and then leave a lot of time for the audience. You've got a pretty big and distinguished audience here, and I don't want to hog it. Um, you talk about agile thinking. You've got a new development command. You've got a lot of resources in the Navy, the War College, the postgraduate school. How do you see that all coming together in a different way? Now, that's a great question. And so a theme in version two of the design is uh, continuing this project we started in 2016 in particular to energize the Navy as a learning engine, right? We have got to just learn faster than our adversaries. And we are looking at uh, just about every way that we can do that. Um, and you know, the Navy has a rich tradition in this. Uh, there's a great book out called Learning War by Trent Hone, and it talks about the Navy as a learning organization uh, from when we became a global nation, kind of the end of the 1800s, uh, and the book goes up through uh, uh, victory in World War II, and how the Navy learned its way forward uh, all through that uh, period. Uh, hey, we're in another competition that's gonna require us to learn faster than our adversaries, be more agile. And so uh, you mentioned a couple of really important elements of that learning engine are schools. So we have the Naval Academy, the Naval War College in Newport, Naval Postgraduate School out of Monterey. You know, these academies, if you will, are going to do the academic part of uh, this learning. But hey, that's got to extend out into the operational Navy. And so what we learn and, and, and conceive of in the uh, War College uh, has to extend into war games. Those war games have to go out into exercises there's got to be an experimental dimension to this. And stitching that all together, uh, I just thought we needed a, a kind of a conductor of that orchestra. So we're going to stand up a three-star position, the director of war fighting improvement, uh, an N7 on my staff, to kind of make sure that this all is a coherent uh, approach to getting after this great power competition, the problems that face us. So. Actually, you prompted a, another question. Sorry, folks, but let me have one more. Um, war games. My understanding is we've actually had some of our allies play in war games. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how the Navy is thinking about working with allies in this new environment? Mm -hmm. well, I think that the uh, one... And uh, I would add friends. I yeah. mean, like Yeah, Sweden. well, yeah. And so uh, we talk about war games in a couple of different places. You know, one is certainly the operation of war fighting line of effort and the learning part. Uh, but we've got to be mindful that uh, 
we just don't fight alone anymore. There's no such thing as just a naval uh, fight. And so uh, our nearest partners are going to be our sister services, right? So the joint force is going to approach this, and our wargaming approach has got to accommodate a joint approach. And so if you don't look to your left and right and see your sister services in the war game, it's probably time to stop and get them in the room. And then similarly, uh, we're going to uh, expand out uh, to uh, other elements of national power. And so you know, the interagency has got to be brought in. And so then you go out from there and you're talking about allies and partners. And uh, boy, there's a whole spectrum of, in terms of the roles that those allies and partners can play. Uh, some can go with us right to the very high end of maritime you know, combat. Uh, some are going to be doing other roles but I think these information technologies uh, really allow us to stitch that team together in the most optimal way possible right now. And we're seeing that borne out in a, in a number of combined military, uh, maritime forces, you know, first in the uh, kind of the uh, Mideast, the, the Central Command, AOR, NAVCENT, uh, but also I would say in NATO as a, uh, as a maritime force, uh, inc including allies and partners. Uh, Lots of uh, incitement about the, the Joint Forces Command in Norfolk and the role that they can play for NATO to enhance the alliance, uh, the maritime dimension of that alliance. We have standing NATO maritime groups that uh, go around and do good work. And so uh, all of this coming together, I think, is uh, an expression of how important it is for us to be able to do this work with our Joint Force and with our uh, allies and partners. Well, thanks. <coughs> you know, um, Please, uh, even if you're famous like Tom Pickering, please identify yourself, Tom Pickering. <laughs> First question, and everybody else too, please, just so CNO knows who's asking the questions. Thank you, Doug, very much, and thank you, CNO. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a member of the board. I want to ask a question on China, naval diplomacy, and the South China Sea. Just a brief introduction. I'm a proud former junior naval officer. <clears throat> Secondly, I wouldn't be here today if my great-grandfather hadn't survived a grounding in the South China Sea in 1866 as an ordinary sailor on a barkentine bound for Canton. Um, my question is easy and hard. I asked a former very distinguished American ambassador to China. I won't identify him, but he's a Mandarin speaker. What is the most important thing, Mr. Ambassador, we can do with China? Uh, to deal with the issues in the South China Sea. And his answer surprised me, in some ways uh, pleased me. He said, ratify the law of the sea treaty. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. You and your profession have always been on the team in that direction. We live now in an era of treatylessness, where in fact multilateral things are dead on arrival. How can we both keep alive the notion that we'll use that treaty whenever we can and move in the direction of ratification? Uh, long term, difficult question, but certainly strategic and involves naval diplomacy. Yeah. That well, was an easy one. Wasn't yeah, it? just. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, first, I've got to say that uh, I agree with that answer 100%. Uh, and I think that uh, in this dynamic maritime environment that I just sort of skimmed the surface on in terms of managing emerging opportunities in the maritime, uh, you know, they are international waters, right? And we want to preserve that nature of international waters. We don't want to divide up the world's oceans into some kind of sovereign types of things. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is a pretty good document in terms of striking the balance. And as these, uh, let's just take the Arctic for instance, how are we gonna manage this emerging uh, opportunity for uh, resources and everything else? UNCLOS gives us a tremendous template to manage those types of situations in a peaceful manner. And so we all have to buy into that. And uh, I think in the aggregate, uh, our nation is well served by doing that. And uh, and certainly the, the world economy, the world is well served. So I would advocate for uh, ratifying that treaty. We behave pretty much in accordance with the rules of behavior that underpin that treaty already. Uh, and it would be good to be a signatory to that treaty. It just lends a little bit of authority, I guess, to what we say. You mentioned NATO, so I think I ought to call on Ambassador Virchbau. Sandy? Thanks. 
Sandy Verschbau here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, as part of the great power competition that's back, uh, the Russians are back big time in the Eastern Med and especially in the Black Sea. And since the uh, occupation of Crimea, they've uh, built up all kinds of capabilities uh, on, the, on the occupied peninsula. What more can we and, and NATO do uh, to reestablish a, a balance in the Black Sea? Uh, do we need to push the envelope on the Montreux Convention? Uh, should we set up a headquarters in one of the literal states such as Romania? Uh, right now, the Russians are kind of asserting themselves, establishing dominance, and we're not pushing back. Right, so this is, uh, gets right to that uh, question about, uh, I guess, conceptual agility in terms of, you know, what are our not only responses in pushing back, but how about, how about we push first in a couple of areas? And so uh, I think uh, you know, it would be great if we could get uh, folks, Russians, uh, uh, some of these competitors to respond to our first move. Uh, and so there's an advantage every now and then to play on the white side of the board, right? And, uh, and so uh, that, that could uh, come under a number of different options, I think. Uh, Everything from what the measures that you mentioned, you know, we've been consistently present in the Black Sea, the United States Navy, uh, and in fact, we did uh, two pres uh, uh, deployments up there uh, just in the month of January alone. Uh, you know, we're working very closely w in exercising with uh, the navies in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Black Sea region, uh, and so uh, you know, staying engaged in there, staying present, actions consistent with words, uh, I think is an important part of that. Um, one area where we're uh, doing some new things is with respect to missile defense. And so we have Aegis Ashore in uh, Romania. Uh, I think that that capability you know, makes a tremendous statement. And uh, so you know, continuing to do that, but we've got to take our own side in this fight. We've got to give the, uh, the other team something to respond to. And then certainly, I think, uh, in, you know, NATO has, a, it seems to me, uh, and I know I'm, I'm preaching to <laughs> the, the experts here, uh, to provide sort of slow and steady pressure, right, to sort of suffocate these options over the long term if uh, we can get together and act uh, with the full power of the alliance. And so uh, you know, the, the whatever leadership role that we can provide there, I, I think as an alliance we, we bring more to the table uh, together than any kind of a bilateral approach. You don't have to be an ambassador to ask a question. So. Uh, do I see any hands up? Yes, please, identify yourself over there. Hello, good morning. My name is Max Trujillo. I'm a policy consultant here in Washington. I was thinking of the expression you use of going back to the fissure. In the Caribbean, for, with the exception of the maybe the 1960s, pretty much we, the, the U.S. Navy had pretty much a relaxed environment in the Caribbean. Now, as the Russians is more active, and eventually the Chinese will have more resources in the naval fleets, and they'll they have more of a presence now in the Caribbean, and probably will expand. We'll have now probably two fleets of foreign countries in the area. It, what is the future assessment of that potential new reality, and how do you see our reassessing our superiority in the Caribbean? Thank you. Well, I think uh, we've got enough uh, uh, capacity uh, to respond to whatever might ar arise in the Caribbean. And so you know, we've, got, we've got great insight into that region. And so in terms of sort of a force level response, I think we're in pretty good shape there. Uh, I would say that uh, with respect to an, a national approach, the military is probably not the first element of national power I would go to in terms of uh, making sure that we stay effectively engaged in this hemisphere, not only the Caribbean, uh, but in uh, South America as well. And so uh, what we see, and, and it's, it's just well known, is that uh, these are you know, economic types of uh, uh, entrees that are being made as much as, in fact, much more than any military. And so uh, I would advocate for a balanced national approach. I think that this is where Secretary Pompeo is certainly going. Uh, to sort of make sure that uh, we don't lose a march in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Hi, Admiral Richardson. I'm Steve Grundman. I'm a fellow here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, one of the uh, items on your agenda of agilities was concepts, concepts of operation, 
Uh, this feels to me like a, a topic which is gaining a lot of momentum. It, by my reading of, for example, the report of the National Defense Strategy Commission, um, this was its most most uh, distinctive recommendation, is that we work harder at innovating concepts of operation. My question is, could you help all of us understand that that idea seems a little obscure, almost arcane, except for those of you um, who've been practicing and in, you know evolving concepts of operation over the entire course of your careers. What should we understand that means, Give maybe by example of an innovative operating concept? Well, okay. Uh, the reason it's a challenge is because we're kind of have a you know a, a vacuum there, and so. Uh, but I would say that uh, you know there, there's a lot uh, I, that I think we can do in terms of first of all just being a little bit more clear about um, uh, adhering to this uh, international order that we've got, right? And a lot of these uh, a lot of the things that we are responding to. Uh, are people just sort of taking liberties with that order. So for instance, uh, one of the things that we made clear during the visit to China is that, uh, hey, in terms of rules of behavior on the high seas, uh, first of all, uh, we do have a, an operational construct that uh, is designed to minimize the chance of miscalculation when two of our ships meet each other on the high seas. And since uh, our presence there has been consistent in terms of force level and, and what we do, their Na the Chinese Navy is growing, uh, there's going to be more opportunities where we meet. And so these rules are going to be operative uh, more and more. And we should approach each other all the way down to the tactical level, our frontline commanders, in ways that uh, actually uh, make it easy for us to adhere to these rules of behavior. So let's not be obstructing one another, driving our ships in front of uh, one another, throwing obstacles in front of the uh, ship, right? Just let's just be biased towards making it easy. And then uh, these rules have to apply to all of the forces, right? So it can't just be uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy to which they apply, but it's also got to be the Coast Guard, and it's also got to be the maritime militia, and everybody's got to abide by these. Being more insistent about those would be a good first start, right? And, uh, and then, you know, we could start to see uh, a a rule set emerging that might have to do with this uh, automatic identification system, this system that ships carry around that talks to where they're going, what they're carrying, it, it provides a lot of information. You could see a regime where, hey, if you're not uh, squawking on AIS uh, that's consistent with where you are and what you're doing, then, you know, th <laughs> there, there might be some, uh, uh, depending upon where you are, some reason to challenge, right? And, and so just sort of putting some enforcement mechanisms in so that, that uh, it uh, makes it harder to play fast and loose with the rules, I think. But you gotta, you gotta make a move to enforce those things. I think that a lot of that structure exists, it's just we gotta be a little bit more muscular to enforce it. One, two, so. And then we'll see how much time is left. Um, hello, my name is Askold Krushelnitsky. I work for a Ukrainian um, newspaper that publishes in English called the Cave Post, and I am a Patriots fan. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, a follow-on um, question to something that Ambassador Vershbo um, broached, which is about Russian actions in the Black and Azov Seas. Um, you said, Admiral, that um, there have been two deployments in January by the U.S. Navy to signal um, certain things to the Russians. But it seems and, um, that the Russians desist for a while in their interceptions of merchants um, shipping when this happens, uh, but then they go back to, um, in, in, again, intercepting, sometimes for days, halting um, f uh, merchant ships. Uh, and the aim is to just strangle trade um, with uh, the Ukrainian ports on the Azov Sea, it seems. So I know it's a diplomatic, uh, tricky diplomatic question, but what else um, does the Navy envisage doing in maintaining maritime um, rights in that area? This is something that this must be done uh, with a clear intent, right? So there should be the uh, right to pass through the Kerch Straits into the seas of, of Azov uh, unharassed, right? And so uh, once we define that as our aim, uh, then 
the, the international pressure, the regional pressure in, and the sort of the robustness of the response there, I think uh, over time has got to be, there's got to be a response. And so, uh, you know, the, the U.S. Navy, by virtue of being consistently present there, we exercise with the uh, Ukrainians uh, every single year, you know, shows that level of commitment. And then, the, you know, the regional response, I think, uh, uh, certainly with uh, U.S. participation, if not leadership, is going to be a, as important as anything as we just kind of increase uh, the, the pressure uh, and the consequences uh, of, a res of uh, that type of action. But uh, trying to do this bilaterally, I think, is, uh, is, is not going to be as successful as a, a regional multilateral approach that squeezes in on a, 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 a well-defined objective. Sir. Thanks. Good morning, Admiral. I'm Doug McGuire. I work with Synax Cybersecurity. We're a, a partner of DOD, actually on the Hack the Pentagon programs. And you talked about the need for agility with technology or to stay ahead of the no-huddle offense of our adversaries. Um, if you could explain a little bit about how you're looking at deploying new tools or how to use some of the innovations that are happening within DOD to supplement the cybersecurity teams at, uh, at the Navy, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. I think uh, first and foremost, you've got to uh, you know, sort of organize for success. And so in terms of the Navy's information warfare effort, uh, you know, if you're a, a traditionalist, this is where, you know, again, things are uh, in many ways the same, but in many important ways different. Uh, naval power has generally been defined in terms of our warfare communities combining together. Those warfare communities traditionally were undersea warfare, surface warfare, and air warfare, okay? That's how we all stitch it together. And each of those communities had a community leader, it had a warfare development center for concept development, it had you know, a personnel management uh, system, an education and training path, and all of that to you know, deliver that type of uh, naval power in that uh, domain. Uh, if you look now, there is a fourth pillar uh, to the way that the Navy is organized, and the fourth pillar is information warfare. And so we have a information warfare type commander down in Suffolk, Virginia. They are responsible for kind of the man, train, and equip of information warfare uh, professionals. Uh, we have the 10th Fleet up in uh, Suitland, I'm sorry, uh, up in Fort Meade. And so that is, you know, right there next to uh, NSA uh, is our kind of cyber fleet, okay? Uh, and we've got teams that are deployed really globally. In, in response to uh, this emerging information warfare threat, which is not only cyber, but also space, also, I would say, electromagnetic, you know, all of those things. Uh, we have an information warfare commander in every strike group. And so in addition to, you know, the air warfare commander, the undersea warfare commander, et cetera, an information warfare commander. And if you go to the strike group briefs these days, the information warfare commander starts the brief talking first, about how we're gonna get after uh, the uh, electromagnetic part of this uh, event, and they always talk last in terms of, okay, you know, how are we going to finish this thing up electronically? And then throughout, you know, how uh, jamming, deception, you know, the uh, cyber, all of that is going to play. Uh, we talked about war games a little bit earlier. Uh, we're now getting to the point where we've got to start uh, in a robust fashion, wargaming these elements of conflict. And so, you know, too often we just kind of white card the uh, cyber part. You know, that's going to go perfect, here's your white card. And, and we know that it's much more complicated than that. So we've got to start thinking about wargaming these so that we understand when we're going to need the authorities to do the things that we need to do in this uh, domain, how soon we have to get started on getting those authorities, building the tools that are going to be the effective part, you know, and decisive in that domain, and so a lot of richness uh, uh, in terms of learning. And then, of course, it all has to come together, you know, with sort of nanosecond timing, right? And so, uh, you know, getting that all fleshed out is going to be an important part of uh, this learning engine uh, and, and the wargaming part of that going forward. We've got a few nanoseconds left. I saw a, a hand up there, a lady, and that's going to be the last question, I'm afraid. Hi, uh, Hope Sack with Military.com. Um, I was interested in your remarks about um, 
rapid prototyping and wanting to get better about that. And I, I would be interested in kind of your top couple of programs that you'd like to put on the fast track. But I also wanted to ask about um, one technology that was kind of much hailed a couple of years ago, and we're going to deploy this in 2015. And, and since it's kind of slowed way down, and that's the um, electromagnetic railgun. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about where that effort is heading. And uh, I think there was a story just a couple of days ago about how right. maybe nowhere. So Maybe nowhere. OK. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, well, listen, uh, in terms of the rapid prototyping, um, this is another area where, uh, just in general, we need to move faster to get capability out into the hands of sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines, right? And again, this is a self-inflicted wound. We just need to get better on this uh, ourselves. And uh, the, uh, uh, as I've kind of you know, studied this, I suppose, uh, I would say that sure, we could revise DOD 5000, the acquisition rules and all of that, but this is fundamentally, in my mind, a human resources problem. And we need to find those people that are both you know, smart and capable, uh, motivated with a sense of urgency, that understand the stakes at play and are biased towards getting things done rather than biased towards not, right, and uh, slowing things down. And there is sort of a general bias, and there's a lot of people in the in the in, in the in the community of travelers that you have to get going down the road, and almost any one of those can slow the process down. And so I think leaning the system out, finding those fewer but more motivated and capable people to move this thing forward is a is an important first step for us to take. Um, now, uh, where are we applying? We, we've created sort of some speed lanes, if you will. With a, uh, we're not we're not bypassing any rules, but we've got you know some folks that are biased towards action to try and bring uh, unmanned uh, out to the fleet as quick as possible in all three domains. Uh, you know, we've got an unmanned tanker who was kind of conceptualized in the 1718 time frame. That thing's going to be integrated into the air wing by 2024, right? So that's a pretty fast uh, march for a, an aircraft program. Um, we're we're doing things with uh, uh, warships, right? So the new frigate program is going to be a start. This is something that we uh, sort of conceived of in 18, and we're going to let the contract for that in 20. And it's going to be designed with innovation and rapid modernization in, in its DNA, right? So uh, it'll be able to modernize very fast and, and follow Moore's law or whatever curve technology takes. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, Unmanned surface, unmanned undersea, so unmanned technologies. We've got, uh, in terms of directed energy weapons, we've talked about those in a couple of different area, uh, times. Uh, we're moving that family of directed energy weapons uh, forward because uh, it really takes kind of a family approach. Similarly with missiles, we really need to regain range on our missile systems, and so there's a family of missiles that we're trying to move as quickly as possible out to the fleet and then uh, produce those in decisive numbers. And so, you know, there's a number of other types of things, but those are three right off the bat that I think we're trying to move. Now, you mentioned railgun. Uh, I, I would say that railgun is kind of the uh, case study that would s say this is how innovation maybe shouldn't happen. I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's been around, I think, for about 15 years, or maybe 20, right? And uh, so rapid uh, doesn't come to mind when you're talking about time frames like that. Now, we've learned a lot, right? And uh, the engineering of uh, building something like that that can handle that much electromagnetic energy and not, you know, just explode is uh, challenging. Uh, so we're going to continue after this, right? We're going to install this thing. We're going to continue to develop it, test it. It's too great a weapon system. So it's going somewhere, hope, okay? Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, kind of uh, not uncommon in innovative types of approaches is uh, there's these, these things, it's like the, the post-it note, right? It wasn't invented to be a post-it note, but heck, that's what we use it for now. The, the projectile that we uh, conceived of to, f to be used with that uh, electromagnetic railgun is actually a pretty neat thing in and of itself. So this high-velocity projectile, which is also usable in just about every gun we have, right? So it can be out into the fleet uh, very, very quickly, independent of the railguns. So this effort is sort of breeding all sorts of advances 
Uh, we just need to get the clock sped up and, uh, with respect to the railgun, okay? Well, Ad Admiral, CNO, we've overrun our time, and that's because you answered so thoroughly. And uh, yeah, so we really code for I spoke too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, actually. Um, you actually were pretty straightforward, which is cool. Um, and uh, the Navy, as you said, you're, you're the point the end of the American national security sphere right now and will be for some time. And I think, uh, and I hope you'll all join me in thanking the CNO for what I think was a terrific presentation. Thank you.